Hi guys, this is the Baby and Straight Jacket Podcast. I'm Zombie Wildman and I'm joined by our special guest, uh, Louis Bourne. He's a black belt, hands are Gracie. Uh, we're here in Brooklyn, New York at the Grappling Club, which if you've never heard of it, it's an awesome, awesome gym and you need to check it out. So, all right, so today I have 10 questions about jujitsu and our gym that I just got to ask Louis. Uh, and so without further ado, uh, question number one is, uh, what's your BJJ background and how did you get started? Uh, I got started watching a Boss Rutten YouTube video where he was showing like a front full Nelson neck crank, um, which I then went and tried uh, in a clothing studio basement with some friends wrestling. Um, I used to box uh, a lot and drink a lot, and so um, we would just have little fun scraps that late at night. And, I just saw that I was catching everyone with the submission. I was like, dude, maybe I should get into jiu-jitsu. Uh, and that was kind of the start. I moved to Brooklyn. Uh, Where were you originally from? Uh, Los Angeles, California. Okay. Yeah, I'm from Los Angeles. I lived in New Jersey for uh, over a decade. And then the rest of the time I've been here in New York. For so the drunken sailor fights, were those back in Los Angeles? Those no. were in the Lower East Side when I first moved here. Um, I, I mean, that, Boss Rutten is the reason why I got interested in jiu-jitsu um, for, for legal reasons and I got tired getting uh, getting arrested and putting the holdings over uh, fisticuffs. Um, mm -hmm. In the state of New York, it uh, doesn't matter, someone could be starting some shit with you, someone could have taken your wallet, someone could be grabbing your girl's ass and if you defend, backpedaling or not, crack someone, they get cut, or an angle test, they come, they go to the hospital, you go to jail uh, until they're released from the hospital. Why? I think it's just in case someone dies from a, from a strike. But if you do that on a Friday and you go to, you go to the tombs. the whole weekend. You go to the tombs and you're, yeah, if anyone's familiar with uh, the Manhattan jail systems, uh, you end up in the tombs, you, you go see the judges usually on the same people on the weekend, so you're, you're there until fucking Monday. Um, it's not about getting bailed out. So, I wanted to find ways to finish fights where uh, I didn't make them unconscious with no marks, right? With no marks, no like oranges and socks. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think practicality and a little bit of Bosch uh, really Rutten. You know who else was inspired, inspired by Bosch Rutten? The Marshall yeah. Whisperer? Uh, Tito Ortiz. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Oh. Bosch Rutten is uh, a. This is a good podcast. He's, uh, he's, one of, he's one of my heroes. One of my heroes. That's awesome. Uh, hardest work in uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Uh, question number two. Uh, how did you become the head coach of the Grappling Club, and what's the history of our gym? Uh, so the Grappling Club was started by, that's over right there, Alex. Uh, it was actually the Greenpoint Grappling Club for a handful of years and then moved to this location. Uh, hey, I just jump in. Right now we're in Williamsburg. The nearby, yes, so yes. nearby the nearby. South yeah. of Hooper. Um, and uh, this is Alex's gym. Um, he opened up a second location in Flatbush with a friend of mine, John Callistine. And I never met Alex until that point, but I was helping John Callistine put some finishing touches on the builder and the carpenter. And uh, that's how I met Alex, um, who yeah, was exactly. at his time, who was at the time sick. And uh, ended up getting sicker. He uh, ended up passing away at 36, which kind of left this gym in limbo. Um, I was teaching at Flatbush, uh, the key class. That Probably how many years ago was it? Uh, this is a couple of years ago, so two years ago or so. Um, like kind of during the pandemic, mm -hmm. and was when all this kind of went down. And, um, I ended up coming here to teach, uh, getting to know. Uh, the surviving owner of the gym, Mila, and uh, came to manage, and, and next thing you know, I formed a partnership uh, with Mila, and now we, we own the gym, and uh, I own the head shop and, and run it full time. Um, awesome. Yeah. Well, we're going to have uh, pictures of the gym and pictures of uh, the former founder, uh, but it's a really unique space that this the way it's, uh, I guess, decorated, just that the general vibe creates uh, really cool, really unique. Um, and that's cool that you kept it alive. Yeah, uh, people uh, people often ask, like, oh, you know, what's like, what's the vibe of the gym? I'm like, I have plants. Uh, <laughs> I <love this. laughs> and, uh, at some point, but I've got like 
we all plan February, you know, when uh, when Alex left, I uh, left the void. This actually used to be a white box, like the match for why we're not sitting down with a great man's house. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it's, it's been said that uh, it's like a fracture in time where the gym continued, but in a different iteration of it. So, it's kind of like an evolution tree. Yeah, and so, yeah, there was a branch in the timeline, so I'm, I'm doing the best I can to both uh, honor the space uh, and the legacy as well as teach good jujitsu. I know, we'll, we'll definitely do that. Um, so question number three, I think you actually kind of answered already, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Just so so uh, I've heard, there are many questions that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu answers, but in your opinion, what is the single best uh, aspect of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu if you had to pick one? Uh, it is the only form of inactive meditation I've ever come across in my life. And I've done some humming, I've done some fucking chanting, I've done binaural beats, I've done breathing exercises, cold plunges, yoga, right? But all of that takes some fucking effort, right? And time, and it's a practice and an argument of itself, but you know, there's no other time where, you know, when someone's trying to strangle you, you're not thinking about your bills, your divorce, your girlfriend, your mortgage, your job, your, you know, your cell phone, like you're not thinking about anything. You're in the moment, actively trying to solve a resisting problem, right? And so the byproduct is a good sweat. The byproduct is, you know, the same martial arts is a way to pull the slack, tighten the body, and polish the spirit, right? And so all of that is really a byproduct, but the peace of mind I get in, in the most chaotic of exchanges is priceless, irreplaceable, and imitable. Absolutely. I think. Yeah. Well said. Uh -huh. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, for me, it's just time for therapy, you know, just, uh, but, oh, okay. yeah. Uh, question number four. Uh, if martial arts are an expression of oneself, how would you describe your style of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and how does it reflect you as a person? Uh, I know that one of my instructors, Daisuke, Daisuke, yeah, he always said, Louis, Louis, he has a Japanese accent, but he's always Louis grind the style. Like, so my style of Jiu Jitsu is grinding. Um, it's relentless, which is, uh, people know me off the bat. So it's kind of, it's like, I got two speeds, fuck yeah or fuck you, right? So it's like, it's, a, it's binary, right? It's like ons and offs. Um, and so I think my Jiu Jitsu style is relentless. Um, I'm known to be a hard worker and, uh, and a go getter. So I think uh, I try to be a, a relentless, a relentless force uh, when I'm on the mats. Awesome. Yeah. yeah great answer so far. I'm, 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 I'm thoroughly happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can retake we can, we can uh, anything. I don't no, 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 no. This is, this is awesome. Damn. Right. Um, <laughs> Damn. Okay. Um, these are more technical questions, but uh, what position is most valuable to train if you had to pick one? You mean what aspect, like the back, the mount, guard passing, right. guard? I think, I think guard passing is, uh, is a skill set that I, I think people are overconfident in when, uh, when they train and drill. Uh, for me, like, I, I think I the think level is guard passing, pressure passing. I think passing the guard is, is important uh, for me. Uh, I've always been kind of a top player. Uh, I love playing guard, um, but I would say guard passing followed by being able to have a good open guard, which really means like guard retention, guard recovery, and, and being able to be modular between your open guard, uh, open guards and uh, and go to guards. Like, like I was teaching today, with yeah. open guard setup for a Dela Hiva tripod, sleeve, sex club, and stuff like that. So, uh, but guard passing for me is. Just paramount. It's, it's something that we instill in all of our students here. Uh, also, so okay. In tandem with that, the next question is: uh, What position is most uh, uh, undertrained, but should be trained and perfected by more people? Why? Well, it's hard to say what more people should do, but um, I'm just saying, have like some people, you know, uh, like leg locks, were introduced to this, and there were people who specialize in it. You know. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going back to guard passing. Okay. Uh, that's guard passing through, through, through and through. I think that does, it is kind of a, a tandem answer that I gave you, but um, I, no, no. I think guard passing is the most important. I think it's 
uh, something that I, I I don't see I don't see it as prevalent as I see like some of these esoteric cards. Do you think that's because there's more Obano players in Jiu Jitsu generally than Kung Fu? Well, I think right to the whole idea of Jiu Jitsu was like guard. Mm -hmm. Right, close guard. That was like the thing. Like, oh, it looks like you're in a shitty position, but you're fucking people up and so. That's why I mean. That's why I think like people pull guard, right? Because yeah. it's it's you end up being off them. Like, if you can't take someone down, you're gonna pull guard, right? Yeah. Like, even even with my collar drags. Like, if I fail at my collar drag and you stay on your feet, I've essentially pulled an aggressive guard, yeah. right? And so it's a position much like half guard that you end up in a lot. So that's why I think people are a little more proficient there. Um, so you kind of tag on that too. Um, can you compare, of course, the benefits of an open guard versus a closed guard? Uh, I think it's it 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 depends on your distance management or your awareness of distance, right? Um. Open guard is when your closed guard has been open. Now, what kind of open guard you have really depends on the range, whether I'm using a spider guard for my longer range or a delahiva guard for my long wing, or I'm using something like a lasso guard if they're on their knees, um, if I'm transitioning to a lasso guard, um, and then a closed guard being my closed guard. Uh, what was the question, which is more important? Or no, more? I, I was just asking you to, to compare the benefits of an uh, open guard versus closed guard. Uh, I think the benefits of a closed guard is uh, being able to control someone's posture and movement. Uh, closed guard, for most people, is not where they want to be, as you know, my smashing yeah, yeah. craft system uh, really works off of being in someone's closed guard. So I invite it, but uh, closed guard is usually the last place most people want to be. Um, you can find a lot of stalling for closed guards. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. It does answer it. Oh. So I'm say just kind of position of a last resort, right? It's, it's more defensive. Uh, I, you have a lot of options, but uh, yeah, I I prefer my last guards and my Delta Um I don't. Um, but you know, you look at a guy like Hodge Gracie, and like his closed guard is not to be fucked with, right? Like no. it's it depends on your style. Um, I think not being deficient in one guard is probably the way to start. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Uh, question number eight. Uh, in your opinion, why is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu quickly becoming the most popular combat sport in the world? 20 years ago, you had to look for it. Now it's almost in every country. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's not a matter of salesmanship because I think if the product is good, you don't have to sell it. Uh, it's, it's arguably one of the more efficient martial arts. Like, you don't see a lot of Aikido experts winning championships in the UFC, right? Um, I think because of the advent of MMA uh, or, or the progression of MMA and, and that popularity of where now UFC is on SP, ESPN, like, uh, you know, and it's, it's taken more as a professional. Like, you know, Jiu-Jitsu is just a, a staple in, uh, in what martial arts is now. I think that I think the popularity of wrestling, boxing, and jiu-jitsu uh, have all been elevated by mixed martial arts' evolution, um, both in the media and as a mainstream sport. Uh, I think it's entered, you know, mainstream. I think it's become mainstream and it's proliferated, right? And as time goes on. The black belts that enter the world and open up their own school. It is. It's like a fungus, right? It's just spreading. It's mold. We're spreading like violent black belt mold. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's a good thing. <laughs> Alright, great, great. Okay, um, how do you define the difference between between a white belt, a blue belt, purple, brown, or black belt? Ah, uh, there. Well, like, I guess expectations uh, for me. Yeah. Like, we, we know white belt, you don't know anything. So, what, you know, why, well, white belt, you're really trying to understand the language which you don't understand, right? Um, you see white belts in the first class and you teach them something like a tripod, so you feel like, how does, how does this apply? Well, you know, how do you get into this position? Uh, what, what 
position would you would you uh, would you find yourself in where this is what you need to do? And it's like, well, you're really just trying to teach a vocabulary. Uh, a survival. You're just trying to survive in an intelligible way. I think with a blue belt, you're looking to be able to escape, right? I think white belt to survive, blue belt to escape. Um, I think purple belt is starting to implement your game. Um, and I think if brown belt, you have a game that you're shaving down to be something concise, efficient, and reliable. And by the time you get the black belt, the things you have, the tools you have should be reliable. Um, the competency, like your literacy, if techniques, if techniques or words, uh, you want to be able to have an intelligible conversation. You don't need every inversion technique, right? But you need to be able to structure your vocabulary of techniques and into an undeniable argument. Because jujitsu is I do this, you do that, I do this, you do that, forever. Right until someone Sounds like chess. until <laughs> someone has you know a better point or an argument that you can't deny, and I'm trying to make my jiu-jitsu be an undeniable argument. Okay. Right, if that makes sense. So I think makes confidence, sense. I think competency is what separates belts. Um, that being said, depends on where you're getting your belt. Some places may give you your belt calendar. And so, what separates a black belt from a black belt? Like you compare me to some of like my instructors who also have a black belt different degrees, it's like two different fucking animals, right? But um, I think competency uh, and people should have different goals for each belt. Not just a matter of uh, techniques that you're trying to learn, but what's your intention, right? Um, throughout your belts. There's different, you know, there's different schools of thought for what each belt should be doing, but that's my general concept for it. Okay, awesome. Um, let's see, okay. What are the drawbacks and benefits to gi versus no gi? Laundry. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I'm a I'm a I'm a gi guy through and through. Uh, I love training no gi, but my no gi game is not like I don't teach no gi not because I don't know no gi. It's just. It's not, that's not what my main focus is. There are, you can be good at both. You know, you said you can't, because I don't fucking believe that. I think you can be good at both. Um, I think I'm a little behind in the arms race, right? Like, you really, like, the amount of time with some of the guys that I know that are really good at Nogi, um, and only do Nogi, right, is, like, these are guys that, while I'd be leaving the 6.30 a.m. class in Brooklyn, they'd be there for an hour or two drilling leg entries afterwards. Like, I'm going to fucking work. I've got, like, shit to do, right? And so, um, you only have so much time. On Does no one else have a job, I think, right? No, uh, <laughs> yeah, no kudos. Kudos to right. folks that can spend all of their fucking days on that. If you love something, do it, right? right. Um, so, I think the... Was a question. The difference is definitely going to be laundry uh, and preference. I think a lot of guys that are high level in the gi find that when you start fucking around with guys that really good leg locks, you're getting got. And people don't like to get got. So I think if you can free your ego and mind enough to go delve and suck at something, um, sky's the limit. Uh, it's tough to eat humble pies. <laughs> It is. I mean, I, I eat them all the time. <laughs> I eat them all the time. Uh, but uh, the biggest difference is one. Okay. Okay. Awesome. All right. Last question. Um, can you explain what it means to have a curriculum based training and why should people come check out the Bracken Club? That's a good question. You know, I, uh, my head no game instructor, Coach Tim, uh, he has his own gym, Bag of Lunch Jiu Jitsu. Check them out. Um, we are. System based and result oriented. Um, the stuff that Tim and I are showing on these mats, um, it's it's what we've compiled over years. Like that Samson Smash Pass I've been working on that for like six years. And the first three years, I was just getting arm barred, flower slept, I was getting fucked up. And I was told it would never fucking work to throw it away. And I'm still advised against giving it up, uh, to give it up, but you know. Um, the stuff we're teaching is stuff that we use, 
you know, my mother was like, you got your black belt, you're gonna quit now? I was like, it's not the way it works. Like, <laughs> you know, your technology is only as good as its most efficient application at the highest of, uh, at the highest of levels, right? So if I believe in what I'm teaching and I'm teaching systems, you best bet that those are the systems that I'm taking uh, into training when I'm training with my competition team in the city, um, into classes where you know, if I go to the Upper West Side, I'm trying to, I'm trying to fact check. And it's like coach said, like I want, I want something to not be true so I can make it even better. What I don't want is false positives. So why am I system based? So I can keep putting the same thing out there in different scenarios and see how it's actually checking out in different parts of the field at IBJJF or at Grappling Industries or at Henzo's or here where people know my game. Um, and the system, being system based leads to results. The proof is in the pudding, right? Um, the guys are doing in here what they're doing in competition. What they're doing in competition is the stuff that we're teaching here. So it's haptic feedback. And sometimes you make it cut. Yes, what's haptic feedback? Uh, like when you, when you, uh, if you're typing on your phone and you have the vibration on, okay. and you feel the vibration, okay. Um, like it's, you can, you can tell, right? You can tell when you're taking it out that it's, uh, I can feel if this is working or not, right? And so I think a lot of people stay in their rooms and they get false positives and it feels good to think you're the fucking killer and then you take it out to competition and you see some, some people get their, you know, dicks kept in. And, you know, last thing you want is to get, to get it broken off and you're in front of your cat, your cousin, and your mom that you beg to come out to this tournament, right? Like, don't, don't get got, right? And if, and if you do get got, it's because you've been outclassed. And if you, you're getting outclassed there, if you're taking footage, if you're taking video, and there's a specific point where we can look at what we need to improve. As opposed to thinking you're hot shit, going out there and realizing that ain't shit sticking to the wall. That's a harder game to tighten up. So system-based, result-oriented, and wherever you fall short, like it should be pretty easy. To at least identify where you fell short. So um, it's been working for us for some time. Um, I had a heavy competition year, the last year of my brown belt, and the results the results spoke for themselves. Doesn't mean I'm the the best in the world, but to know that I ended up at brown belt rank 13th, you know, in the world of my division was proof that with just like about a year of Competing in IPJJF, like I made, I made some slashes, cuts, and uh, and rips through through a division that I that I really worked hard to, to climb up. So nice. Well, that's all our questions, ladies and gentlemen. Louis Gordon. Thanks. Um, I didn't really get prepped for any of these questions, so hopefully <laughs> I, I got to give you guys some. It's all honest on the fly. Um, yeah. If there's anything, we'll add it in the notes. Uh, <laughs> Videos being posted. Uh, if you have any questions or clarifications you need, come find us at the Grappling Club uh, located on South 4th and Hooper. We're open seven days a week. Come find out how we're high water. There's an awesome gym. Make your way out here. Louis, thank you so much. My God, he's going to be missed. No, I'm going to miss you. I'm in back though.